Will iOS developers flock to Windows 10? The economics of the app stores and a cheaper Tesla is in our future. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 333 for Thursday, May 7th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about the tech news. And joining us today is Jason Snell from Six Colors, the incomparable podcast, formerly of Macworld. Welcome, Jason. And many others. It's good to be here. <laughs> yeah. uh, good to be back. Thanks for having me. Well, last week, Microsoft announced the Universal Windows Platform Bridges that's designed to help developers create apps for Windows 10. Now, this app platform will allegedly make it easier for developers to, to create cross-platform Windows apps it will work on PCs and tablets and phones and HoloLens and Surface Hub, Xbox, Raspberry Pi, the whole bit. Uh, for iOS developers, they introduced something called Project Island Wood that will come out this summer, and that's what's supposed to make it easier for them to develop their apps to work on Windows 10. Do you think this is something that will take off with iOS developers? Well, that's a really good question. I, I think... If an iOS developer is curious about what uh, what Windows has to offer, I think this is great because they're going to be able to reuse a lot of their Objective-C code. And Objective-C, of course, is what you use to write iOS and Mac apps, but basically nothing else. Um, and, you know, I think for Microsoft, they're really just hoping that people will try out their platform and discover that they like it and decide they want to develop specifically for it. I, I don't think this is a recipe to... I don't know, if I was a developer, I don't think I would say, oh, here's my plan. I'm just going to keep on developing for the Mac or for iOS and let the Windows thing just kind of happen with Microsoft. I feel like that's less realistic than the idea that I, I think Microsoft hopes that they can uh, capture them once once developers spend a little time with their platform and say, oh, this is cool. Maybe I should develop some more specific things for Windows um, because it is, you know, it is a bridge. Uh, they're going to have to try to keep pace with Apple in terms of the functionality. As Apple introduces new things, Microsoft's going to have to kind of match it. Um, so we'll see. In the, in the past, this is not this kind of thing has not been historically like super successful. But I think this speaks to where Microsoft is right now. They they need these uh, iOS and Android developers to develop, especially for um, for the you know for Windows Phone. So uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. But I I think I think the best case here is it'll it'll induce some developers to consider Microsoft's platforms that when they might not have before. Right. So they're really talking about phones and tablets. They're not talking really about Xbox. I mean, they're not talking about here's a way that iOS apps can be ported to Xbox. That's not really what we're talking about. I haven't heard that part of the story, although, you know, it wouldn't shock me if they had something like that where there's this idea that Windows development goes everywhere. It goes on the desktop, it goes on mobile, and maybe it goes on Xbox too. But I think the focus here really strikes me as being about mobile, about getting on tablets and phones um, with apps that currently only exist on iOS or Android. Right. Well, what do you think about this whole take that Sachin Nadella is doing? I mean, he's, it's really a new Microsoft, um, and I know that you're an Apple guy, but is this something that you find surprising that he's doing, or you're just kind of same old, same old? No, this, I think this is, this is like total Sachin Nadella. He is touching the third rail uh, of old Microsoft. Like Steve Ballmer, you know, Microsoft first, Windows everything, and Nadella is a pragmatist. He looks at he looks at mobile and says, "We're behind. We're number three in a two OS market. How do we catch back up?" And instead of just saying we're going to take the Windows PC install base and and use that as a battering ram, he's saying, "Let's go. Let's make great cloud services, and let's make it easy for developers on those platforms to try our platforms, and let's make great things on our platforms that will make them want to stay once they get there." I think, you know, I think Nadella by throwing out a lot of the sacred cows that were there under Balmer is, he's taking a shot. And I, whether it works or not, I don't know, but I really applaud that he is willing to say, we're gonna do, they, they announced a, a code editor that runs on Linux and Mac, as well as Windows last week as well. I mean, that, I don't know, that these are, these are things we don't expect from Microsoft, but that's because uh, we got trained with the old Microsoft and such a Nadella, you know, he's, he's a smart guy, he's a pragmatist, and he's making the moves he feels he needs to make to uh, 
to uh, keep Microsoft running. And I, I applaud him for that. Yeah, it's definitely been interesting and will continue to be. So let's talk about the Apple Watch. I just got mine today. You, know, you have the same one, the Darth mm. Vader watch we were yep. talking about. Now you have some interesting tips on uh, six colors. You said one that I read today, you said if you're using Apple's remote app or the now playing Glance, you can turn the digital crown to adjust the volume of the source you're controlling. And you talk about this as something that might be obvious to some people, but uh, not to others. So I tried it today with Pandora and it didn't work. So you're saying it just right. works with those two features? So there's a, there's a bunch of things going on here with the Apple Watch. One is that, you know, we get these ideas of, oh, it's intuitive. And, you know, the Apple Watch is not intuitive. The Apple Watch, occasionally you'll do something and go, oh, that did exactly what we wanted. But a lot of times you're like, what will happen now? Because it's a new device and Apple's trying some new stuff with it. And saying it's not intuitive I think is not a condemnation as much as to say that a lot of intuition comes from familiarity and we don't have a lot of familiarity with devices like this. So yes, I was in the now playing glance and I spun the crown and it actually did what I thought it might, which is uh, make the volume go louder. And that works in, in Apple's glance now playing in Apple's app remote. But this is one of the things third party apps don't have access to the crown. So maybe when Apple rolls out new developer tools, which hopefully will happen in June at Apple's developer conference, then um, those apps might have power to do things like use the crown, play audio through the speaker, all sorts of things that current um, watch apps and glances just can't do if they aren't from Apple. Right. And so the crown also doesn't work to turn the volume up on the watch itself for notifications or anything like that. That doesn't... Yeah, in certain cases, the crown does things. It scrolls in a lot of places. It turns, uh, you know, it changes... Uh, changes volume, it changes settings. Uh, there are places where it works, but it's not consistent, and the third parties are kind of locked out from it. That, that's really the big, the big thing here. Is if you're looking for Pandora's app, Pandora can't look at the crown and say, "Oh, the crown is moving. I'm going to change the volume." Not yet, anyway. Right. Are there some other tips like that that you've stumbled upon that you're like, "Oh, most people don't know this, and they might want to know it." No, I mean, it's all over the place. Uh, reordering reordering apps uh, that you can do it from the phone and the watch. There's a lot of things that you can do from the phone that you might not know that you've really got to poke around in the Apple Watch app to get a better sense of it because the Apple Watch app has a lot of functionality that's not on the watch, um, including like setting your your contacts in the little ring. You can actually set that all. You can do custom responses. That all happens in the app. So that would be part of it. Um, double tapping the crown is a is basically a, an app switcher. It toggles between the watch face and your most recently used app, which I didn't realize it's on a little slip of paper that's in the box. But I had to have a bunch of people tell me because I was complaining that you couldn't do that. And they said, oh, you can. You just have to double tap. And uh, double tapping on the other button uh, activates Apple Pay. So there are a bunch of things like that that you just have to figure out. And we're all just kind of uh, internalizing now. It's part of the language of the Apple Watch that we didn't speak before. Right. Have you used your watch yet to pay, at, to use Apple Pay? To pay for oh, yeah. I bought, uh, let's see, I bought some uh, cheese at Whole Foods. And I bought, uh, and just the other day, I bought a couple of hot dogs at the Giants game at the at AT&T Park. So oh, right. it I totally works. But yeah. then something didn't work when you were trying to get into the park, right? Yeah, so Passbook, um, they said that it was a bad scanner, that actually the person scanning people in at the turnstile said, oh, yeah, this scanner isn't going to work on that because my scanner is bad. Use her scanner. I guess, you know, some scanners are, scanners have personalities. Who knew? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I tried to use Passbook to get into the park, and in the end I used it on my on my phone, and that worked. But I, did, I, I didn't get to do it with the Apple Watch. Although that's one of those cases where Apple's done something clever, like Passbook, you want to have that barcode. And most of the time, in order to save battery, it turns off the screen. Like when you move your 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 uh, wrist away from you, it turns off the screen. When you move, uh, when you scroll down to the barcode in Passbook, um, it goes to full brightness and the, the auto lock turns off or at least has a long delay. Um, so that makes them much more scannable. But alas, the uh, the guy I was uh, talking to at the, at the turnstile had a had an unfriendly scanner, so I didn't get to try that feature out. Well, I've just gotten used to uh, paying with my phone at our grocery store next door, the little Petaluma Market. They just got Apple Pay, and they already look at me weird when I use my phone. So I tried ah. today, and I didn't have the. I wasn't brave enough to do it because I, you know, I don't know why, but I just thought people would look at me weird. I don't know. A, lot, a lot of those terminals are not built for um, for watches. Like I, I was uh, flying home and uh, from a, an East Coast trip, and I thought about using the watch for my passbook to get onto my flight. But the way they had it set up, you were really meant to stick your phone under it. And there was no room for me to stick my watch under it there. So, right. you know, there, there, and some pay terminals are like that too, where you have to kind of contort yourself to get to the pay terminal with your watch when it's just easier to just tap it with your phone. 
Um, that said, one of the nice things about the Apple Pay on the watch is if you leave your phone behind, you lose a lot of functionality from your watch or from your phone uh, when you're using your watch. The, the, you know, the watch relies on the phone for a lot of stuff. But Apple Pay is not one of those things. Apple Pay, if you leave the watch on your wrist and you leave your phone behind, you can still pay for stuff if you're out and about, which is kind of cool. Right. That is great because I always leave my wallet behind and, you know, I probably will start leaving my phone behind. So now I've been seeing a lot of stories over the last few days about a new app called Redacted. It lets you easily remove parts of a picture before sending it. So you could send someone a picture of your driver's license and then just, you know, mute out the sensitive information, block it out, redact it, I guess. Uh, now you posted a link to the developer's blog, the guy who developed this app, and it has some kind of appalling figures about how much money app developers are really making from their apps. Tell me a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, I, I think this has been the feeling for a while now is that the Mac App Store, everybody thought would sort of do for Mac software what the App Store did for iOS software, and it kind of hasn't happened. There are a lot of successes in the Mac App Store, but there also is this sense that, there, that um, a lot of apps people want to use can't qualify to be in there because of Apple sandboxing restrictions. Like there are a lot of backup utilities that just can't be in the Mac App Store because they have to have access to your whole hard drive and... Apple doesn't want um, Mac apps to have that kind of level of access. So some of it is that. Um, and then in the sense, you get the sense that it's all a little sleepy. And what the redacted story is, it's not about like, do people really want to buy a $5 app that blurs out things in your images or not? It's not about the app. I think the, the point is this $5 app was number eight top paid in the U.S. and he made like 350 bucks and that's on day one. And what that means is that 350 bucks was enough to get you in the top 10 in terms of paid apps, that's a bad sign. And I think he's in the top 20 for revenue even now. And uh, I, that's an experience very similar to the one that I had uh, when I was back at Macworld with our with our iBook store. Um, we had at one point like six or seven of the top 10 tech books in iBooks. And I know what we were making on those books. I know how many copies we were selling and it wasn't that many. And that just gives you that sinking feeling like, wow, it's great that we're on the chart, but if we're on the chart, and we know what we're making. That's a bad sign because there's nobody else making even that. And uh, I think that's the I think that's the thing about the Mac App Store is people are a little frustrated because of the limitations, but there's also the, just this sense that outside of a few really good high-grossing apps, there's a whole lot of nothing in the Mac App Store right now. Right. So he says uh, this developer says that he's going to go independent. I mean, is that a better way at this point for people who are doing Mac apps? Well, I mean, I, he also has a has a day job, and he's not going to quit it. I think that's part of it too. He's working at Venmo, I think, um, mm -hmm. which is smart move. If if your best, if your first day of your app that you worked on, and you get three hundred and fifty bucks, that's a bad sign. Mm -hmm. You know, most people were guessing it would be like ten grand, and it was uh, not. It was three hundred and fifty bucks. Right. So, I, you know, I think uh, a lot of developers do these as side projects. That's a good idea. Going outside the app store, um, I'm not sure going outside the app store saves you any any um, any money or increases your sales in any way. I mean, the, in being in the app store is really great for search, for discovery. The problem is if you want to do an app that is just against the rules or requires incredible contortions to meet the needs of the app store, like BB Edit, the text editor, uh, which has been around for more than 20 years now, it was in the app store for a while. The latest version's not in the app store. And the developer basically said, it's too much work to keep up with Apple sandboxing restrictions and add on a whole bunch of extras that people have to download. It's a bad customer experience. So they just gave up. So I think that's the reason a lot of people leave the Mac App Store or don't bother to get in it. It's not because they don't want the visibility. It's because, you know, Apple has some very strict security rules for some good reasons, but it means that a whole slice of what we think of as computer utilities, I mean, and it's a bigger portion of the PC market and the Mac market than it is of the mobile market, those kind of utilities, and they require a whole lot more access than you know, a game does or a very simple app does. And uh, so they can't be in the store and that throws that whole category out of the uh, out of the store. Right. Well, Jason, thank you so much. You have a lot more content just like this on Six Colors and, and you have a billion podcasts. How many are you doing now? Roughly, it's about four a week, but you know, you know, podcasts are good. You, you like them. I yeah, do, yeah. so You can check out the incomparable.com for my pop culture podcast and relay.fm for my tech podcast and sixcolors.com for all the stuff I write with a keyboard old school. Well, thank you, Jason. Take care. Thank you. Coming up, how the NSA broke the law and the truth behind the Facebook echo chamber. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to take better photos, learn to code, master Excel, 
or create an app. Lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. If you want to learn how to develop an app, I recommend some courses on Lynda.com. Some of their new ones are developing Android apps, Essential Training, Google App Engine Essential Training, and two new installments in Lynda.com's Code Clinic series on JavaScript and Swift. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream all these video courses. There are thousands of them. Stream them on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along. Or if you're just looking for one answer, you can skip to that point right in the video. And your lynda.com membership also gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. If you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash tn2. Sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2. And we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Yelp shares surged 16% after Wall Street Journal reported that the online review website is exploring a sale. Yelp has a market value of about $3.3 billion. Good news in a case we've been following for a while now. A New York Federal Court of Appeals ru ruled unanimously that systematic bulk data collection from the NSA is illegal. According to the New York Times, at issue is Section 215 of the U.S. Patriot Act, which the court says cannot be legitimately interpreted to allow for bulk collection of domestic calling records. This is the first time a higher level court in the regular judicial system has reviewed the NSA phone records program. The Verge says that fitness wearable maker Fitbit has filed a $100 million IPO. The company also announced earnings of $336 million in the first quarter of this year. That's an income of $48 million. The company says they sold 10.4 million devices last year. That's up from 1.3 in 2012. And Mashable reports that on an earnings call yesterday, Elon Musk revealed a timeline for the Tesla Model 3. It will cost a mere $35,000. That's compared to the current cheapest model, the Model S 70D, which costs $75,000. Musk says you'll be waiting for the cheaper model until mid-2017 at the earliest. Tesla also offered net losses of $154 million in the first quarter of 2015. And finally, a study about Facebook politics published today in the Journal of Science. It says that the social networking giant isn't at fault for your unwillingness to consider alternative political views. You are. The study is based on an accusation that Facebook creates a kind of echo chamber by only showing you content that aligns with your political beliefs. But data in the study about what links people click says that we're the ones who only read the content that confirms our biases. And what we click leads the Facebook algorithm to deliver more content just like that. The study tracked 10 million of the most partisan users on Facebook and found that the news feed algorithm leads conservatives to see 5% less liberal content than their friends share and leads liberals to see 8% less conservative content. What do you think? Is Facebook ma making us all less tolerant? You can tweet me your thoughts at Megan Maroney or email them to tn2 at twit.tv or directly to me at megan at twit.tv. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash tn2. You can write to us at tn2 at twit.tv and you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.